This is like finishing a line from Happy Birthday. It's escaping my mind, and I know I know it. I don't know, skip. Thrill the fight. Great! Go and tell me, little one, tell me patience, go and tell me. Pass. Pain? Yes, good, okay. <laughs> Great. Get out of my dreams, get into my, ooh. I'm not sure. My car. Oh, great. Okay. Billy Ocean. Uh, we're halfway there. Oh, we're halfway there. Living on a prayer. Oh, okay. Doesn't it repeat itself before it gets there? <laughs> I was starving till I tasted you. No, I can't. Oh, oh my God. What is it? working as a waitress in a cocktail bar when I met you. Oh. In a small town world. In a lonely world. It's just the midnight train going anywhere. Just get the midnight train going anywhere. It's a great song. Lonely, oh my God. You can tell when I grew up, I think, to talk about things. Because he's drunk and alone. Nights? Ooh, na na. <laughs> ah, okay, once again, it's probably new. Huh? Come a chameleon, you come and go. There. Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on, chameleon. Yeah, okay, got it, uh-huh. I just dated myself, huge. There's a rhyme here, isn't there? Uh, my time is now. There was a moment where I was driving the car, driving Bumblebee. I actually myself physically wasn't driving. There was a special rig in which a man on top of the car was in control of it. So very weird feeling being in the driver's side of a car and not having control over it. We were coming downhill uh, into a turn at a rather fast speed. And we come to find John Cena's character and his sort of fleet. We came very close to hitting that man and he did not budge. Meanwhile, I let out a sound that I've never heard from myself ever because I was so entirely fearful in that moment, but he didn't move, so I found that quite impressive. We would have hit John and had that happened, the car probably would have been damaged. You would have never guessed that it, yeah. Yeah. I'm watching a Volkswagen bug come at full velocity towards my body and thinking, well, if this is how it ends, it's, it's been a pretty good run. And uh, they, they, this far, and I told myself, whatever happens, don't move. And I didn't move. I knew the driver, we had shared some conversation. I also had a chance to drive with the driver and knew that he would be able to push the limits and still be safe. And I'm glad we developed that sense of trust because otherwise I would have needed a new set of pants. The magic of the deleted scene is on Charlie and George's face. Uh, that's uh, Haley and, and Memo reversed uh, because they really thought, like they can't control it and imagine thinking like, oh, no, stop, stop, but they couldn't. I never once broke. And they looked like they needed a new set of pants. So that's the deleted scene that you need to see. The very first day that we shot on location, uh, you know, having worked in animation before for 20 years, you know, it's a very controlled environment. We shot the first three weeks on a set, on a stage, which is very much like what I'm used to in animation. Everything's controlled, the climate, the lights, everything. And then we had a travel day where we went up to the Bay Area, of, you know, near San Francisco. And when we scouted it, perfect weather, beautiful weather. It was exactly what you wanted. And we got there and it was miserable and cold and windy and gray and wet. And it was like nothing we'd, we'd, we'd uh, anticipated. And I was grabbing my head and I'm saying, this is going to be a disaster. Having never done it before, uh, I was like, this is how it's going to be shooting on location. And everyone was just cold and miserable. And yet you'll never know when you watch the movie because you know everyone's a professional and they do a great job. So Haley's given this beautiful performance and then cut and then someone runs with a big parka and a, and a space heater to warm her up in between the takes. But uh, you know, she gives a beautiful performance. You would never know she was freezing. John's a trip because you know, I knew him before as a, as a, as a you know, great comedic actor. And, and so this role calls for something different. It's a little bit different from what John's done before. But we definitely want to take advantage of, of that aspect of, of his ability. And so essentially we would get at the, at the end of every, uh, every, every scene, you know, we, would, we would shoot the scene uh, straight. And then we'd always leave a little bit of time for John to 
just John to be John and do his thing and to play around. And some of those moments actually wind their way into the movie because he's just so naturally funny and charming. And then of course Haley, yeah, I mean she's, uh, I mean she's an incredible actress, but she's also a great singer. She's always singing on set, and it's like you hear this beautiful music in the corner, and there she is, you know, up creating a new song. So it was just, it was fun to be around that level of creativity. You know, I have a tendency to sing, I guess, when I don't really realize I'm doing it. So um, that was probably a thing in between takes. It wasn't really ever a everybody join in type moment, I don't think. But apparently I was singing on set, so great. He let me throw away a lot of takes. And that's where you kind of see Agent Burns drop. And this peculiar individual takes some time for himself and to just fire off some insults. Uh, I, I hope some of those make it. There's a ton of deleted scenes. I mean, you know, there, you know, I, I, I firmly believe in the notion that the trim of the vessel the more can carry. You know, we were trying to tell a very tidy story, and and then you you know you start to build on top of that, and so in the end, as you're as you're piecing these things together, you shoot a bunch of stuff, you edit it all together, and even scenes that are really really great. You know, we have scenes with the robots, we have other other scenes with Charlie and her work life and her family life, some really funny scenes, some exciting action scenes. In the end, you've got to craft it, and if the pace lags, you got to find ways to tighten it up. But we have you know we have many 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 scenes that are going to be in the deleted scenes on DVD and home video that I think people will get a, a, a greater sense of the texture and dimension of this movie. There's this one scene where, where Bumblebee, where, where he goes into uh, Charlie's house for the first time and, you know, madcap antics ensue. He's this stranger in a strange land, this giant, this bull in a china shop trying to figure out how these things work. And he does something in the house that causes things to go completely awry and uh, a bunch of mad things happen. It was, it's kind of like Sorcerer's Apprentice from the old Mickey Mouse thing. It just the, the entire thing just goes bizarre and haywire in ways you wouldn't expect. And ultimately it slowed the movie down, so we took it out, but it's tons of fun. I think people really get a trip out of it when they, uh, when they see it on DVD. There's a few in, that, in the big uh, boardroom, in the big conference room, where we're talking about giving uh, Transformers access to our technology. And there was a lot of dialogue in there. Uh, they probably have an entire movie. Bumblebee isn't really there. It's a 14-foot eye line, which is a, a stick and a tennis ball. So to see that and then see that, that's really cool. Sometimes it was a tennis ball on a stick, uh, which we joked about putting a face on for a while because it's literally just a tennis ball. Uh, and then another version of Bumblebee was this sort of bust-like figure of him that I was able to use when I needed to, you know, hug him or use him, you know, in that sense. So uh, it was interesting because it was obviously very hard going from working with, uh, being in a scene with people than being in a scene with something, you know, that's obviously so crucial to the film that's not there in real life. But it was a challenge and it was fun. I tried to drive off with the Beetle multiple times, my moped as well that I, that I ride in the movie. Didn't get to take anything though, but I'm still working on it. Emails are still being exchanged. Haley had most of the interactions with Bumblebee, so I was never lucky enough to get even the bust and or the head. It was just always a stick and a tennis ball. But needless to say, it was, it was fun to perform with a stick and tennis ball, and it was even more fun to see the universe that was created. I took home a tennis ball. If you ask Paramount, I didn't. I didn't, I didn't take that tennis ball, but I did. So I have a tennis ball. Uh, I can't prove in any way, shape, or form that it was from the movie. Uh, I, I bought a sleeve of tennis balls, threw the other two away, and I have one, and I claim that it's from the movie. Yeah, I think the obvious, uh, the, uh, the obvious answer is Optimus Prime. I mean, he's, the, he's, the, he's essentially the main one. But I always had a soft spot for, uh, for Wheeljack. When you, watch the, uh, when you watch the cartoon, the very first Transformers you see are Wheeljack and Bumblebee. I thought he was so cool. And, uh, and so I made sure that he's in this movie. You know, blink and you'll miss him, but he's in the very beginning of the movie, just like he was in the original animated series. I mean, she genuinely is a different person uh, at the end of this film than, than where we meet her at the beginning. So I do feel like she has a lot to say and a long way to go. Um, I'd be interested myself to see where that is. Honestly, I'm not being biased, but Bumblebee is my favorite Transformer. So I'm very excited I get to be a part of his, his story. There's, there's hints of exploring more of the Transformer world. Uh, I think once we tell the basis of one character, people are going to want to see the heavies go at it. So I would like to see, I would like to see why the Decepticons feel the way they feel. So maybe diving deeper into what got them so jaded, I think is a cool story to tell. I wish, no, uh, no, that was done sort of uh, post, post the post-production, um, but he's wonderful and uh, really happy to have him a part of the film. Dylan, uh, you know, he has a relatively uh, small 
part in the film because Bumblebee loses his voice relatively early. As an animator, you're always listening to people's voices, the way they speak, because that's one part of the performance. The other part is the physical performance that the animator brings to life. And so if, if we were gonna have Bumblebee speak in this movie and to see how he lost his voice, I wanted us to really have a sense of something meaningful and beautiful was lost when that voice is taken away from him. And so I was thinking about, you know, young actors with incredible voices and Dylan was at the top of that list and he came into the, the recording studio and, he, and he, you know, he came in with such verve and energy that it was, I, I remember kicking myself, I was like, ah, oh, it's a shame, I wish, I wish this was in the movie more, but because of the story we were telling, he occupies this small but very important part of the film. I was involved in one instance where I could hear that voice, but what I did hear was a man speak behind a stick in a tennis ball. Absolutely. In fact, I remember when I first saw uh, my character Gwen Stacy, the you know animated version brought to life, and I, my immediate thought was, it's such a shame this isn't live action because I would get to wear that outfit and have that hair and look so great and so cool. Um, so if that is ever you know turned into a live action film, oh my goodness, of course, yeah, I, I would absolutely love any any sort of opportunity that presents itself in that in that space.